Welcome to Comic Books and You. Today we are going to be talking about Yokotsuno number 9, La Fille du Vent, The Daughter of the Wind. This is going to be probably a longer video since this is a 47 pages comic. Therefore, uh, there is a lot of material to cover. I've tried to cut it down a little bit so we can discuss it a little bit more. But it's not going to be as easy as some of the other comics we went through. I have to say as well, uh, Yokotsuno is probably one of my favorite comic book series. There is a lot in it that I, we will talk about. And it's a series that we are going to come back to fairly often as well. We're going to go through the characters as usual. So our first character is Yoko herself who is a Japanese immigrant to Europe in Belgium, uh, works as an electrical engineer in a TV station in Belgium. At least that's her original job, I would say. You don't see her work in that particular field very often throughout her adventures, but she has that particular background. She also is a black belt in Aikido. She's skilled in piloting various forms of aircrafts and other vehicles. Also trained in other forms of combat by one of the other characters we have in this particular volume. Uh, she's familiar with a variety of alien technology due to her contact with an alien civilization, which also uh, led her to be trained in a variety of other things at the same time. This doesn't affect this story all that much, but it partially explains how she is some sort of action hero at the same time due to that super, like, well, it's supernatural training. Her main traits, she is courageous, but a little bit impulsive. She follows traditional Japanese behavior in a lot of situation. She is not stereotypically Japanese, but would be following those uh, traditions Closer than even characters in manga, probably due to how the author interprets the whole thing. Two of the other characters we are going to see and that are uh, recurring throughout the various Yoko Tsuno history are Vic Video and Paul Pitron, who are her co-workers slash boss at the TV station. Uh, Vic is represented as a smart, courageous, and reliable man. He is Yoko's love interest but it's never clearly stated, mostly implied. On the other hand, Paul is the comic relief character. So Vic would be the straight man, Paul would be the comic relief. Standard duo in comic, especially French, Franco-Belgian comics of the era. Same as uh, Tintin, Capitaine Haddock, or Spirou et Fantasio. So you've got our heroic one and our comic one. But of course, here they act as supporting characters to Yoko, who's the actual main character. So it's a bit of a play on that particular mechanic between the characters. Both of them are extremely skilled in a wide variety of transportation, combat, investigation, deductive skills, you name it, partially due to their contact with the same alien civilization as Yoko. Neither of them are super important in the story. They're mostly there to drive the for story forward. Uh, you could have had only one of the two show up, but it kind of makes sense to have all the trio work together uh, as that's how they're generally depicted and they generally behave as a trio. Our next character is uh, Aoki, who's uh, Yoko's custodian, confident while she was uh, younger. He started his life as an Imperial Japanese Air Force pilot during World War II. Uh, he was destined to become a kamikaze. Uh, but due to instrumental error, while he uh, went on a mission, he had to crash his plane near Japan, and he was rescued by Yoko's grandfather. He had quite a bit of uh, shame due to that, but he became a Buddhist monk, and Yoko basically gave him a reason to live afterwards. He's an honorable man, he is dependable, he uh, dedicated to his many tasks, which included partially raising Yoko while her scientist father and grandfather uh, did their things. So he is mainly a father figure, even though he is not uh, Yoko's direct relative. He is not even from her family. Um, one thing I do find fairly weird, we never get his last name while in normal Japanese behavior. That's what we would be knowing him as, is mostly his last name, rather than his first name. Uh, we have a picture here of the uh, Mitsubishi Zero, 
that he flew during World War II. You will see me point out a lot of those mechanical image or uh, me of, uh, vehicle images while we're reviewing Yoko Tsuno novels and uh, comics uh, because the quality of the art is uh, astounding, especially on these pieces of work. And you can see here, uh, this is a very nice drawing of that type of plane. Our next character is a villain. You will be recurring in one other volume of Yokotsuno, Ito Kazuki, who's a well-positioned, wealthy businessman with interest in the defense industry. Yeah, and he is in an LT competition with Yoko's father. Yoko's father has been researching ways to uh, destroy typhoons or combat typhoons, and as such, had developed a way to create them so we could test different means of destroying them. Kazuki, on the other hand, wants to use those artificial typhoon as either a deterrent or as a weapon for the glory of Japan. He has a Extreme wealth that allows him to recruit a large number of personnel, various tools, underwater bases, etc. Uh, he has his own private security force, which play as ninjas during the night. He would be your James Bond-style villain, I would say, in this uh, story. And is never represented as having any real positive traits. Let's go through the story. This is, might take a little while. Like I said, this is a larger volume, but I've condensed things down as much as I could. Yogo and her friends are invited by a Chinese businessman to Hong Kong because he claims that her father is about to commit an horrible mistake. We see them land here in Hong Kong at the original Hong Kong airport, which was an extremely dangerous and difficult to land on Pla uh, well, basically platform over the sea. Once they land, uh, there's a contact for the Chinese businessman on the plane, which they get in contact with, and he brings them to a Chinese uh, yunk in the port of Hong Kong. Yoko's father, friend, explained to her that he is in a fight with uh, Ito Kazuki, creating and destroying artificial typhoons. Uh, the problem is that those typhoons are affecting the ecosystem and uh, life in the Chinese Sea or the Japanese Sea, depending on which side of the border you would be, and uh, that it's causing all sorts of issue. So she gets the call, Yoko gets the call sign, Daughter of the Wind, where wind also represents all of those people whose life would be destroyed by those artificial typhoon, and she agrees to help to stop her father and stop Kazuki at the same time. Yoko, Vic, and Paul transfer to a seaplane after a little trip down the sea. And Yoko is given an eye maneuverably parachute to paradrop onto her home island to go to her father's lab and meet with whoever she can. Yoko realizes that the plan might be a bit dangerous and not as well as she would want. So instead of landing in her estate, she decides to land in a nearby Buddhist temple. You have to realize as well that those eye maneuverability parachutes were not common in the late 70s. This is a... Nowadays, we take them from, for granted, but at the time this particular comic came into being, those would have been fairly recent, or at least fairly recent for more civilian use. Ito's agents, dressed as ninjas, let's not ask too many questions, are looking for her at the original spot she was supposed to land. She manages to uh, avoid them while carrying with her uh, a radio. And uh, Yoko slips into the Buddhist temple and gets help from local Buddhist monks to manage to slip past the, the guards. They knock one of the ninjas down, steal her, their uniform, and she goes through to infiltrate her own house. As she walks onto the estate, Aoki tries to stop her, shooting an arrow at him. Yoko reveals herself. They take a little bit of time to catch up, trying to understand what the whole situation is. Aoki basically telling her that everything in the house is monitored except for her father's old pavilion, where Aoki is currently residing. Uh, they get a message sent out to uh, Vic and Paul that are waiting for her in a boat outside of 
the pavilion. But before they can do anything, they are captured. Yoko takes Aoki and the guards that captured her to the old laboratory that she wanted to visit anyways, and basically tricks them by using the original Typhoon generator. So they knock the guards out that way. They run out of the lab, chased by the guards. Vic and Paul ram the dock. Aoki and Yoko jump onto the boat. But at that point, a patrol boat that uh, belongs to Kazuki starts chasing them. And Paul uh, cripples it using a, well, they say a rocket launcher. That would be a recoilless rifle, an MS-63, if I remember right, which would have been a fairly top-of-the-line weapon at the time. Uh, this would be a Vietnam-era recoilless rifle. Paul cripples the patrol boat by hitting it in the front, making a fairly huge hole, which would, in the long term, sink the boat, but wouldn't have killed anybody at the time. While there is weapons being used, things being done like this in Yokotsuno throughout the different volumes, you will notice that the violence is generally kept to a minimum. In retaliation, Ito fires one of his Typhoon rocket, which starts a typhoon, as we can see here. They are in a submarine at that time, uh, which is equipped with those rockets. Our heroes veer the boat off, but their boat is going to be caught by the typhoon. So they jump onto a buoy and hide within it, which is enough to protect them from the damage there. But since Kazuki's men are nearby, they get to the buoy and capture them and leave Aoki alone on the buoy, waiting for Yoko's father to come and rescue him. Kazuki brings uh, Yoko, Vic, and Paul to a special underwater base, which is built on the wreckage of the uh, Imperial Japanese Navy vessel Yamato. And he explains to them that since they are TV specialists, uh, he wants them to film the final battle he will have with Yoko's father, so that the media can view it and the various politicians he's invited to look at it as well can view it properly. So he has a little command post, he has rockets built on it, he has all sorts of storage. Seems like a pretty chill operation, even though the man running it is uh, rather distasteful. Showdown starts after a few days, just to get everything prepared in a way. He shoots his ty larger version of the Typhoon rocket, and one of his uh, henchmen acts the missile guidance system to uh, stop Yoko's father, Seiki, from destroying the typhoon using his anti-typhoon rockets. The problem comes uh, as he, the rockets are act and deviate. They explode next to the typhoon and change its trajectory. And it would hit Kyushu, the southernmost island of Japan, directly, which would cause probably a couple hundred million dollars in damage and probably a large number of deaths. Kazuki's own crew starts rebelling against them after Yoko takes a stand and give her back control of the ship and uh, lock Kazuki out of his own equipment. After getting back to the surface, Yoko meets with her father, uh, but he explains to her that the typhoon is now too big for him to destroy through his regular means. But he has a plan uh, where they would deliver explosive payload to both the top and the bottom of the funnel cloud to destroy the Typhoon using rocket planes, which are stored in this hovercraft as we see there. Aoki is already trained in using those uh, special jet rocket planes. He was trained in secret, as people didn't expect him to be trained for that. And Yoko is already a skilled and trained pilot, so there's no problem for her to do it. So they decide to uh, take action. Uh, Yoko carrying a standard delayed explosion device, while Aoki would be carrying a nuclear weapon, which is required to uh, stop the typhoon. The two take off, reach, reach the top of the funnel cloud. Uh, after going through the various amount of tur turbulence, mainly using a rocket booster, and uh, start the operation by diving into the eye of the typhoon. Yoko drops her delayed explosion device at the top with no issues. 
But as Aoki gets down towards the bottom of the funnel cloud, one of his wing breaks off. Even though the planes are made to resist these kinds of uh, temperature and pressure, he yells a final banzai in the in honor of Japan, and he gives his life for his country, like he desired to do so long ago, but with a noble goal instead of in the pursuit of destruction and war. We have here the uh, dual explosions, nuclear device at the bottom and the regular bomb at the top. It is an amazing image, in my opinion. They've saved Kyushu. After a little while, Yoko and her friend recuperate at her parents' estates. And uh, Yoko says she's going to try to move past this uh, sad event with the death of uh, the man she basically considered to be her father. And she points out that she has future adventures in the stars. All right. After going through this, we're going to look at the cover. This is the original cover for uh, the French edition of Yoko Tsuno number no. 9 by Dupuis. We've got the feminine figure of Yoko on the left side, the typhoon, the uh, rocket jet. So you've got some of the important elements in the story and uh, this attractive figure to draw your attention. So this is a simple cover compared to some of the other volumes in the series, but it is also extremely effective, would attract your attention and your gaze fairly quickly. The version I'm working with right now is an, inter an integral, which is a compilation of three stories. It includes also La Proie et l'Ombre et L'Ordre du Rhin, two other uh, stories, including the uh, next time uh, Yoko meets Kezu Ito Kazuki. This cover mainly feature things from these other two stories. We only have the top right corner, which is from La Fille du Vin. I'm not a huge fan of the this particular cover, personally. Uh, there's also a small internal cover, black and uh, well, brown and white, let's say, uh, with a short blurb explaining uh, what happens to Yoko in that particular story. Not a huge fan of it. I didn't take any pictures of it either. Uh, it's fairly unremarkable. As I said, uh, the version I have with me right now is one I've borrowed from my father. Uh, it's a compilation of three stories. Uh, the original book is in his collection as well. He didn't want me to take it because... He doesn't want me to damage it. Understandable. He would have preferred the original version. It's a bit easier to work with than the large Integral. Uh, quality of paper in that Integral is perfectly comparable to a regular art cover uh, Franco-Belgian comic, which I grew with. I mean, I must have read that book a hundred times when I was a kid. <laughs> I mean, it was one of my favorite Yokotsuno story. Binding quality for this edition seems a little bit weak. It's the first time I really see that in those uh, Editions du Puy Integral, because my dad's got a lot of them for Valérien. He's got a few for uh, Bob Moran. I think it's a different editor, though, but I think it's the same printer. But this one here, some of the front pages are getting unglued. Uh, a little bit weird. The binding doesn't seem wonderful. It might be a problem with this volume, or maybe it's a problem with this particular series, I'll have to check the other volume my dad has when I go and visit him again. This particular edition has a nice introductory section to explain to you the uh, universe of Yokotsuno, what inspired the author, what inspired him to use various forms of uh, art, and how what inspired him and drove him to write the story the way he wanted. It is a pretty good overall uh, explanation. But he also tells us that he liked that particular story, but felt that it didn't explain the origin of uh, Yoko and Aoki's lives enough. Later on, in 1999, uh, Roger Leloup released Les Cunes de l'Aube, which is the first Yoko Tsuno's novel and her first adventure. It explains a lot more of her life, which was she grew up after World War II, uh, the connection with her various family member, her aunt, uncle, grandfather, father, mother. So we have that family di dynamic that is better explained in that novel. It's a pretty good story overall. It is not a comic. It is really a novel. There's a few images and <laughs> drawings in it, obviously, as we are speaking about a professional lifer in comic. 
but uh, this might be something that I review much further down the line. But if you are interested in Yoko Tsuno, this is a very good novel to read if you want to understand her origin. Artistic merit, well, I will be honest here as well. It's probably one of the most beautiful bande dessinées on the market. You might find that the art is a little bit simpler when you're looking at the characters. And if you read the earlier volumes, the characters are a little bit more on that cartoony, caricatural side. While the bit of the later volumes, it's a bit less refined due to the age of the author. I mean, he is 89 as of this year. And uh, he's still releasing comics. I, I think the last one was released last year in 2022. As such, I mean, I can expect him to have some degree of issues. Uh, but it still remains rather top-notch in every way, shape, or form. Especially in the attention to detail that you have in everything. But especially the backgrounds and the uh, various vehicles that you see. Like I said, this is a incredible attention to detail in those background and those vehicles. We have that Junk here. You can clearly see not only its shape, but you have the feel of the fabric in the sails. And even to against that particular background, the characters are still well-defined, and you can quickly pick out Yoko, Paul, and Vic. Uh, we see a Shin Mewa MS-1. Uh, the MS-2 is the one still in production now. This is a um, military-slash-rescue plane from the Japanese uh, military and navy. It can be used for some anti-submarine warfare, but also for, like I said, search and rescue and uh, fighting forest fires. Pretty uh, nice plane overall. And here it is a almost perfect reproduction of that particular plane. We have the patrol boat and the speedboat as well. The speedboat is fairly simple, but still a very well detailed, while the patrol boat is... This is a standard Japanese military patrol boat of the era, late 70s. And this is literally what they look like. Okay, there's no real adjustments <laughs> to do to it. And you have to remember here, there is no internet to look up the designs. There is no AI tools or inter IT tools to help you make those illustrations. They have to be done by hand. And they have to be uh, colored by hand as well. We have the uh, reconstruction of the legendary battleship Yamato with the submarine base attached to it. Also, once again, a very, very nice overall design. It This is what the Yamato underwater looks like. This is an original design by uh, Roger Leloup. Uh, they were basically, those two planes were basically based off cruise missiles but he modified them a little bit to make that super rocket jet kind of design. And as we uh, spoke earlier, we do have that uh, Mitsubishi Zero, which is remarkable. We see the production lines, we see the, uh, the shape it has due to where the metal plates interconnect. Again, a very impressive feat, especially, like I said, you don't have access to any advanced tools to make those drawings, while you would have access to reference material, even working through reference material, this is this would be a reference material, if you asked me, actually. Buildings as well are extremely detailed, almost to the point of realism. The stupa here on the right, the Buddhist temple, is a remarkable design, especially in this particular angle which would not be an angle you would normally see such a building on. The uh, Tsuno Estate here at the bottom as well, another uh, very nice design overall. We are rarely have that kind of attention to details and realism in comics in general. So I'm not going to target or pinpoint anything in particular. This is uh, phenomenal. 
The character design are polished. I did say that they're, I won't say they're lacking. Characters are rec recognizable. They don't fall in that caricature kind of level. You recognize the characters fairly quickly, either through their costume, their coloring, etc. And as I keep saying, all of this was done before any computer assistance, basically. We also have to think of the time frame in which this particular work was done. We complain a lot about modern comics being late, especially in the more independent side of things. And we have a lot of people making excuses as to why it's taking them so long, why it's so complicated, etc. This particular story was originally published in Le Journal Spirou weekly between number 2081 and 2100. So that's 19 weeks of production. So, five months for a 47-page story. We're looking at a rate of about nine pages a month, which can be seen as not the fastest ever, but with the quality of the work we see here, it just can't be compared to modern American comic books. Even if we were to look at the actual golden age of comic book, which is, in my opinion, the late 80s to the late 90s, where the tools were there, the equipment was there, the people were there to make the highest possible level of quality. We don't get to that level of quality. In French comic as well, we very, very rarely reach anywhere close to that level of quality in uh, details, at least. Story elements. Well, there are a few things I need to point out here. The, the story itself does work fairly well, but if you know a lot about Japanese culture and Japanese language, there's a few misspelling here and there of Japanese word. Not too surprising in the late 70s. It wouldn't have been much of a Japanese contingent and Japanese understanding in France and Belgium at the time. That basically came in the 80s. And... The way the characters are addressing each other, the Japanese characters are addressing each other, don't fit what it would look like in real life, let's say. Uh, we would be using last names and honorific, and the only honorific we really see is when the people working for uh, Seikitsuno call him Sensei, which would be appropriate in this case since he is a, a scientist. But we would be... Uh, a Kazuki wouldn't be as addressed as Kazuki. It would be addressed as Ito-san the majority of the time. Same with Yoko. She'd be addressed by the other char Japanese characters, at least, using Tsuno-san or a derivative. We wouldn't know Aoki's last name because that's what people would be uh, using to address him. There's also the odd an oddity, which is common in non-Japanese non-Japanese writing Japanese, in a way, uh, where uh, Yoko yells sayonara as she's jumping off an aerpl the airplane. Uh, this wouldn't be used <laughs> in that case. Sayonara is something that determines a final termination or a final separation between two persons or two people. There are a variety of other words which would be used for see you later or we will meet again which would have been a much more appropriate to use in this situation. There's the weird collaboration between communist China and Japan in the story. It's unusual, even though there was a slight detente at the time between those parties. Communist China and Japan are at odds forever. I mean, I'm not going to say that they were at odds. They are still at odds, and this is renewed yearly by Japan and China. Using Taiwan as the partner would have been more realistic here, probably easier to understand. And uh, we do have to realize that everybody in that general area still hates Japan. So if they had learned that Japan was, or a Japanese consortium was creating artificial typhoons, while there could have been some cooperation, that would probably have led to an escalation of the hostilities in the area. We also have the 
weird inclusion of ninjas in the story. It's an unfortunate thing. It's whenever you're dealing with Japan in Western media, you always end up with ninjas. That's a little bit irksome. Okay, I don't like it in any situation. Okay, it's not just here. Uh, it, it seems like an abused trope that doesn't reflect modern Japan as much as it should. So outside of those nitpicks, I have no real other complaints in that story. The pacing is what it should be. We are kept on our toes for those 47 pages. In art to say anything really odd about it, it is a really, really good story. We have strong moralistic and elements in there honor familiar duty personal sacrifice all things that you want to inculcate and show younger readers and older readers would be able to catch on and understand uh, we have the corrupting influence of money and power that is all represented in ito kazuki and we also have the use of nuclear energy to save japan uh, nuclear energy is the almost universally aided. I mean, it is a thing that is really disliked by almost everybody, even though it is probably one of the safest and cleanest form of energy. The fact that it has amazing destructive power remains a uh, irksome point. But here we see nuclear energy being used in a, in a way to save lives rather than destroy them. It's a, a simple duality here when talking about Japan and nuclear energy. And it is one that is used in quite a few other comics and even manga. Yokotsuno might be um, fairly well known by French readers. There are other stories that are more popular and probably better known than this one. But this is the one that as the most important themes and messages that the author himself uh, brings forward through his things. The sheer quality of the art in those middle volumes here, I would say starting it around after Aventure, Electro uh, yeah, after Aventure Electronique, is where you see an, a, a bump in the quality of the art. It should make modern artists feel ashamed for themselves, especially those who take an eternity to complete simpler projects. We always end up seeing that Tumblr art in DC and Marvel comics, and it literally makes me want to just grab panels from various Yokotsuno no, uh, stories and send it to them and say, like, yeah, look, this guy did it with pencils and pens. You should be able to do better. Yokotsuno was probably also one of the first women hero in French comic, you've got Natasha before, which was a, an air stewardess. The fact that she's a women hero doesn't feel out of place. It's not pandering. She is a character in her own right. And on top of it, she is also a minority, especially in, let's say, 70s, late 60s, 70s Europe. You wouldn't see that many Japanese or even Chinese or any real foreigners in that region at the time. Modern authors should really look at this series to try to understand how to write a character that is different from the local norm and how to write it properly. So I hope you guys enjoyed this uh, run through, this particular volume. Keep on reading comics, keep on enjoying them. I'll keep analyzing them and I'll see you all later. Bye-bye.